So what we're gonna do today is my talk is about how to follow up via email without looking and feeling like a complete dirtbag. So I'm gonna start off, uh, I've got a little intro to go through here for you. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about why you should be following up via email, uh, some of the different situations, what happens when you send an email and the people on the other end, what it is that they are thinking about reasons why we don't follow up, why we don't send those follow-up e emails even though that we know that we should, and then some follow-up strategies that actually work. So a little about me, uh, I assume that most of, how many people here listen to the podcast because I was behind the stage, I couldn't see. All right, so good number of you. So I run the, I'm the co-host of the Startups the Rest of Us podcast. I'm also the co-host and co-founder of MicroConf, and I have a book called The Single Founder Handbook. I have a couple of copies of it over here. We'll give away those to the first couple of people who ask questions at the end. And then I'm also the founder of Blue Tick. So uh, I have other things in my past which we try not to discuss in a public setting. <laughs> but these are the things that are kind of known for. As I said, we don't talk about the other stuff. So when I'm talking about follow-up emails. I wanna make sure that I make this extremely clear because the vast majority of this talk is really not about cold email. And I know that most people, when you say follow-up emails, most people's brains immediately go to cold email. So these, this is not cold email. And I wanna reiterate that. Follow-up emails are not necessarily cold emails. And this is not about the cold email. So first thing, why is it that we follow up? Why do we have to send these follow-up emails? And the fact is that you want to know what's going on. You want to be able to send out the, you want to know that the emails that you sent out were acted on or decided upon, or you're essentially trying to uh, figure out what is going on. So you want to know, first of all, was the email that you sent received? So there's a, a series of four different things that you're trying to find out when you send out a follow-up follow email. Was it received? Did they understand it? Did they make a decision? And this is a key one because if you send out a proposal or a request uh, for more information from somebody, you send them uh, an invoice, did they get it? Did they understand it? Do they know what they're supposed to do? There's lots of ways for people to get confused. Even though you may think that you were extremely clear and I said, hey, here's a, a set of instructions, go make this payment on this bill, and they still don't do it. Maybe they got confused, maybe they screwed up their credit card. There's all sorts of things that could go wrong. And the last thing is, did they inform you of what that decision was? So if you send them a proposal, are they gonna talk it over with their team? Do they have to wait for their boss to get back? There's lots of things that can go on. And the reality is that what you're trying to do here is you're trying to close that loop. You're trying to figure out what it is that you sent out that email for, whatever the reason was, did they make that decision? Did they understand the email? Did they get it? Um, did they talk to their, to, to their team, to their boss? Did they come to a conclusion and the last piece of it, which is the most important, is did they tell you? Because that's what you're really trying to figure out here. You're trying to figure out what is, what is it that you need to do in order to get them to that next step. Because otherwise, what you're essentially doing is you're sending off this email out into, the bla into a black hole. It's a nebulous void, you've got no idea what's going on, and that right there is your email. <laughs> and it's having a great time. So, in this email black hole, there's four different reasons, four major reasons why people don't reply to your emails. And there's lots of other ones as well, but these are probably the, the main ones. The first one is that they did not receive it. So again, we're gonna walk through, like the, they may have mail server issues, um, and that's surprisingly common. I've worked with a product that, has, that works directly with people's mail servers, and it is shocking how many mail servers have problems on a very, very regular basis. I have servers that I will see that go down every single day between two o'clock and four o'clock every morning. And it's because they're doing backups or whatever, but for whatever reason, they're not getting emails at those times. Um, you could be sending it to the wrong email address. Um, I won't go into that anecdote, I can't actually. <laughs> um, it could be getting filtered as spam. Um, you get out of offices or the, the person's out on vacation. They could be at a conference, for example, and then they just don't get to it and they say, oh, well, I'll, I'll come back to it later, and then they just really never get around to it. Another one is they received it and then they just decided to dismiss it. They're like, they may have email filters or rules in place. Personally, I, I know this to be the case. And I know there's other people who fit into this category as well, but I have like 50 to 75 different email filters on my mailbox. I still get upwards of a couple hundred emails a day. 
And a lot of them I don't need to pay attention to. A lot of them I can just categorize in a certain way. Some of them are newsletters. Some of them are updates or things like that. And I don't need to know what exactly, like I don't need to know all the information. I may just want to review it on a daily, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis or something like that. But I still want to get the emails. They could also just get, you may have a, a irrelevant subject line. They may look at it and say, oh, this isn't actually for me. Another common thing that I've seen is that if you send an email to a group of people and you want somebody to do something about it, you're probably not going to get them to do it. You need to send it to one person because if they see that there's three or five other people on that CC list, oh, somebody else will do it. And then they don't have to. It's a great way for them to dodge responsibility. Um, they skimmed it, made a wrong decision. Uh, that's very common if you're not real clear, if you send lengthy emails, I'm known for that. Sending really long emails that are long-winded, people just say, eh, click, done. Um, the gatekeeper says no. The, the, if you send it to somebody, uh, not everybody manages their own mailbox. So it's very common and very easy to have your email picked up by that gatekeeper and the gatekeeper says, oh, well, I don't, I don't need to uh, do anything with this. And I've had that happen to me personally with people who I know very well who have gatekeepers and I've still not gotten by them sometimes. Um, and as I said, that, that wall of text that I'm, I'm well known for. The third one is that it was received with the best of intentions. They meant to reply. And this is the, probably the most common one. Um, working or traveling remotely, uh, they're checking on a mobile device. I check, I'm notorious for checking emails on my phone just to see what they are, to see if anything's you know, on fire or anything like that. This is my daughter, by the way. Nice little <laughs> microconf decision. She's so cute. Um, but the, the, when these emails come in, the, the, if they get pushed down a little bit, they end up dropping off your radar. Um, you know, something in the business could be on fire too. So not just the previous one, previous slide. There's also a guilt that some people have if they receive an email and they don't respond to it right away. And let's say that it goes two or three days, and then two or three days quickly becomes four or five. And then you've got the weekend. And now all of a sudden you've already, you've already waited a week to reply to somebody. What I see a lot of times is that people will not reply to those emails because then they feel guilty. They feel like they have to apologize for waiting so long to reply to that email. And it's surprisingly common. I've, I've even heard conversations about this exact situation here at MicroConf over the past couple of days. A nice side effect or benefit of sending those follow-up emails is that it actually gives them permission to reply when they've waited for too long. It's like, oh, I meant to, do, I meant to write back to this and I just I didn't get to it. And it's a popular misconception to think that if it's important, that other person is going to get back to me. And this can happen even with people that you know, even the people you have worked with before or done business with before. Um, even if it's something important like an invoice, I've sent you know, $10,000, $11,000 invoices before and you know, like, so they just keep being pushed. Um, when I used to do consulting, I used to do it at the enterprise level. And some of these invoices were surprisingly large. And they just get pushed because either somebody says, oh, I'll take care of it, and then it gets pushed by a week, pushed by a week, somebody delays, there's a meeting that's got to happen. And you don't know that any of that stuff is true until you ask for that, uh, you ask for a follow-up and you ask what's going on. And the fact is that the whole idea or concept that if it's important is complete and utter nonsense. It's absolutely not true. How many people here know who Patrick McKenzie is? Most of the audience. So, if you won't listen to me, listen to Patrick McKenzie. <laughs> and he says, but really, busy people are busy people. The overwhelmingly most common reason for non-response is not active disinterest or even passive disinterest. It is didn't organize affairs enough to have enough bandwidth to action the email. Follow up more than feels comfortable, it works. But the thing is, a lot of us still don't do it. And the reason is, that we don't want to be lumped in that category of people who are sending these follow-up emails and are just simply ignoring whatever the response is, they're automated, and we're afraid. And here's what we're afraid of. We're afraid of what this is <laughs> being the response on the other side. We're afraid of being lumped in that category. We're afraid of being put, like, promoted on Twitter as the person who's sending terrible emails. There's even a hashtag, terrible, e terrible cold emails, that you can go out and look look for on Twitter, and there's a, a surprising number of people who are contributing to this and posting screenshots, and we do not want to be made an example of. 
who here thinks it's a good idea or uh, something that they aspire to, to be uh, you know, hosted on, on, Reddit, on a Reddit forum and made an example of? Who here wants that? <laughs> Anyone? I, I, I didn't think so. So what, what are the underlying reasons why we're not actually following up? Because obviously we don't want to be made an example of. But what are some of the other things? What are the, the, the little things that are not allowing us to, to make that step, to hit that button? And the first one is that we have a incorrect or a disassociated value uh, association between when we click the button to send the email and when we get a response. And it could be an hour, it could be 10 hours, it could be 10 days or 10 months. And the problem is that it's measured in two places. The value of that email is measured in two places. It's measured when you send that email and when you get the response. And the larger the distance or the time period between those two things, the more difficult it is for you to understand or to conceptualize what the value of that email is and what, this, what sending that email is gonna mean. And it doesn't matter what the value of the, the actual dollar amount is, but in your mind, it's very easy to not correctly compensate for those. So because of that delayed feedback loop, that's a, a major reason why we don't send these, uh, these emails. Another one is because it feels like busy work. If, let's say that you have an email sequence where you want to send out, you've got five different emails that you send out, you want to send out one a day, and you've got a list of 100 people. But you don't want to send 100 emails all in the same day, because quite frankly, that sucks. But so you send five of them. And then the next day, you have to send 10, because if you're spacing them out one day at a time, first on Monday, you send out five. Tuesday, you send out five of the first email, and, but then the people who didn't respond, you have to send out five of the second one. So now you're sending 10 emails. By the third day, you're sending 15. By the fourth day, you're sending 20. And it's not even just sending 20 emails because you could almost say, well, let me BCC these or something like that. But if you were trying to send them as personal emails, remember this is not cold email, you wanna make sure that they look like they're being personally sent. Make it, make it look like you are actually taking a little bit of effort. And when you don't take that effort, obviously you're not gonna uh, get the results that you want. But there's a lot of effort that goes into even just copy and pasting between templates, between a spreadsheet or um, you know, a Google Doc or something like that, just saying, oh, well, this person's at the third step, this person's at the second step, and going through them, it feels like busy work. Plus, we've got a lot of deadlines that we're working on. And how do we feel about deadlines? Deadlines are actually quite awesome. They make cool sounds when they go flying by. But really, I mean, your emotions are going to get the most of you in, in these situations. It's emotionally painful to send these emails. It sucks. You feel like you're repeating yourself. Even if that second email or that fifth email is going to somebody completely different than the first one. The variable reward schedule sounds like a good idea. It's, it's actually in, uh, in situations like this, the psych psychology will tell you that uh, a variable reward schedule is a good thing. But the problem is that those types of studies concentrate on situations where there's actually a reward. When you're sending email, there's an associated negative consequence that could also happen. You send an email and somebody says, hi, uh, I'm, I'm not interested at all. And because that reaction is negative, those negative results count a lot more than the positive ones that you get back. So it's very easy to avoid doing it because you don't want to be made to feel guilty or feel bad about sending those emails. So that disproportionality between the positive and the negatives of it um, will really weigh on you when you're trying to do that. And as I said, the biggest reason why we don't is because we're afraid. We don't want to be made into that example. So the big question before you dive into this is does following up actually work? Because, you know, why would you listen to me if it doesn't actually work. So I'm gonna give you a couple of anecdotes and some data to back it up. So this right here is a tweet from a guy named Sam Nieder, and he shows you essentially a, a series of emails that he sent out over the course of uh, several months. He said, a lesson in persistence, six ignored emails since November. Finally get a reply, and this potential customer is now using a demo of Mason, which is his software product. A non-response is not a no, keep going until you get a no. And you can see there that according to the dates, he sent it over the course of several months. And interestingly enough, he's also a blue tick customer. 
So that was not necessarily intentional. I did not go and say, oh, well, which of my customers has had the most success lately? Like, I just happened to go on Twitter and find that it was him that was doing it. So I did want to just close that that is a, a blue tick customer. So who wants to play a game now? Yes, we've got one. Awesome. So we've got one player. So I have a question for you. And we're gonna talk about some of the stats. So what I've done is I went into the back end of BlueTick and I analyzed 70,000 emails that have been sent from BlueTick. Um, BlueTick is sending in the neighborhood of anywhere between 600 and 1,000 per day, excepting that one time it sent way too many because of a bug to one person. <laughs> that was a bad day for me. And the customer did not cancel. That's actually a completely side anecdote. My customer did not cancel, even though one of his users, one of his contacts got 1,000 emails. They were all exactly the same. <laughs> so if you ever feel bad about yourself, not only did somebody approve making a movie with sharks and tornadoes in it, but I didn't lose a customer over that. So open rate of 26.7%. Is that the best, the average, or the worst open rate? Now, I do want to caveat this. The vast majority of my customers are using um, blue tick in a variety of dis different scenarios, but most of them are using it for, um, do I even want to say that? No, I'll, I'll hold off on that. I'll wait till afterwards. So best average or worst. How many people think that 26.7% is the best open rate? Okay, handful of you. Uh, how about the average? How many people think that 26.7 is the average? Okay, so that's most of you. And how many think it's the worst? Like five. It is actually, did that show up? It is actually the worst. That is the worst open rate. If you look, 94.1% is the best open rate. I have several customers who are getting over 90% open rates. All right, so I kind of figured that you know, people wouldn't quite get that right, so I decided to ask another question. Uh, reply rate of 5.9%, is this the best, the average, or the worst? How many people think that it's the best? One, two, okay. How about the average? How many people think that that's the average? All right, now the worst. Lots of you, okay. So we'll dig into that. Um, it's actually the average. Sorry, kind of figured you guys get that wrong too. So the best reply rate is thir almost 30%. Almost 30 so the, the majority of the customers that I have are using this in warm email scenarios, which is interesting because it means that if you're using it in a warm email scenario, and you're still only getting, the best response rates are only 29% for individual emails. What does that say? It says that if you don't send those follow-up emails, you're probably not gonna get a response. And these are from people that they know, they presumably have some sort of a business or financial relationship with. If you're not getting response rates on a regular basis, even after sending some of those, those follow-up emails, like you have to send more. You need to be able to close that loop. So, since most of you gotten the last two questions wrong so far, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you one more. So, and this is a multiple choice, you're gonna have to pick one of these things. And this is the percentage of people who are blocking tracking pixels. Now, the way that I tracked this was, what I did was I measured the, the uh, emails that got a response where the tracking pixel was blocked. And I can see that, you know, if, if an email sent, did they open the tracking pixel or not? And was there a reply? And in cases where there was a, uh, the tracking pixel was blocked, there were zero opens, and it got a reply, those, that's, that's what I counted here. So the percentage of people that are blocking tracking pixels, how many people think that it's 62.5%? Okay, handful of you. How about 11.3%? Uh, Another small handful. I almost want to like divide you guys into different parts of the room. Uh, 3.1%. All right, good chunk of you. Now how about 0%? Oh, all right. So this was a trick question. I kind of lied a little bit, but that was an effort to help you out because all, of the, all four of these are actually correct. I didn't really specify in the question about the, whether it was the best average or worst. So like each of these numbers is one of those. So the highest tracking pixel blocking percentage was 62.5%. That meant that there is at least one customer I have where they get replies, but the tracking pixel is blocked 62% of the time. And then there's the average, and then lowest, and then there were three lucky ducks who got 0%. The emails that they were sending, nobody was blocking their tracking pixels. So let's take a look at what 
an email sequence looks like when you start drilling down and you start looking at the different steps. So this is a, a view from inside an email sequence inside of Bluetick. You can see that there's a number of people who have gone through a particular sequence. Uh, that top one is the top level stats, and then the next three are individual steps, step one, step two, and step three performance. And what you can see is that the replies from step one to step two, step one has about a 31% response rate, step two has a 30, 30%, 30% 30 response rate, and then the step three has about a 12% response rate. And those things add up, obviously, like if you start adding up those percentages, you see at the top level, the sequence itself has a 78%, is that 70% 70, 70 response rate? Um, but each individual step along the way only has a small, much smaller percentage associated with it. So what that tells you though, is that sending that first email, if you're only gonna get a 30% response rate, but then you send a second one, you get a 30% response rate from that. These things start to add up. And that's where the value of doing the follow-ups really comes from. It's not from that first email. It's not from the sec second email or necessarily the third. It's the collection of all of them. That's where you're getting the value. That's where you're able to close that loop. So let's talk a little bit about follow-up strategies and specifically ones that really do work. So the first one is that there's four different things that you need to keep in mind when you're doing follow-up emails. You essentially have to design how this is gonna work in your environment. When is it that you're going to do it? It's important to know when it's worth it for you to send an email follow-up and when it is not. Because there's sometimes it makes sense and then there's other times in which it doesn't. Second thing is you need to define, clearly define, an action that you want that person to take. Do they need to schedule a call? Do they need to reply? You need to be really, really clear what you want them to do next because if you're not, they can easily get confused and then they just decide to not do anything. Next one is personalization. Um, you need to use their name. You need to make sure that you are making it appear to them as if the email is being sent directly to them. And then in terms of automation behind it, you want to make this as easy for you to send it out at scale as possible. So one of the things that you might think about is like, as, as I said, when is an appropriate time? And that's when you make first contact with that person. Can you guys see this? Oh, is that in German? I've been told, I gave this talk in Germany, I was told that uh, somebody was gonna give me one of their books, they said, well, can you read German? And I said, no. And they said, well, just read it really loud and in an angry voice and you'll be fine. So we'll, I, I guess we'll go on to the, like, the English version of it. So when you make first contact with a, with a customer, after they've, made, they've talked to you, maybe you had a conversation or a demo, you put them in an email sequence of some kind, you wanna follow up with them to get them to the next step. That's an ideal place to have an automated system in place so that you can follow up with them to get them to that next step of your sales funnel. Next one is you wanna schedule that call. Um, so if, if it's an actual call that you need to have, whether it's a, a phone call or a webinar or a demo or something like that, maybe you need to get the right people in the room, another great place for an email follow-up. As I said, the, the demo itself, that's, that's also perfect. And testimonials. If you have a bunch of customers who come through, put them in uh, into an email sequence, follow up with them until you get a testimonial. If they're in for a couple of weeks, I do love this particular image, it's awesome. You need to know what it is that they need to do, or they need to know what it is that you want from them. So making sure that they know what the expectations from you are, whether it is that reply, whether it is clicking on a link, scheduling that time, um, and giving them a deliberate choice between even just one of two things, like do you want to do this, or you know, would you like the red pill, or would you like the blue pill? Um, when you get into personalization, you have to be really, really careful because especially if you're automating these things, because if you try to automate something, how many people have gotten a email that says hi space comma? <laughs> or hi F name, because they're using MailChimp or something like that, not because they have other phrases for you. Um, but the reality is bad personalization is way worse, way worse than no personalization. It can get bad. And the thing is, when you're sending these emails, you have to be consistent about it. If you're not consistent, if you don't do those follow-ups, you're not gonna get those responses. And Marie Forleo, she runs um, a company out of New York City that basically helps um, women, female entrepreneurs build their businesses. 
But I mean, she says that success doesn't come from what you do occasionally, it comes from what you do consistently. And if you are not consistent about these follow-ups, what can happen is that if you let too much time pass between one email and the next, then whatever it is that you're doing is completely irrelevant. Um, this is a picture of uh, some chapstick, which has become irrelevant in my life, which I, I actually did keep that around in my jacket. It was, I found it the other day, so. <laughs> this is not that, I'm just <laughs> prop. So again, those four pillars of making a successful email sequence, when to send it, what action they need to take, personalizing it, and then automating it. So let's go through a, a quick example here. How are you going to design a follow-up process in order to get somebody to, uh, to schedule a demo? So very first thing, you've got the starting state. Uh, you want to make a demo request of them. And then the last step is you uh, want to get them into that demo. But in between, you've got to schedule it, or you want, it, you want them to schedule it and put it some time on your calendar, and you want to follow up with them until they do, because you need to close that feedback loop. So step one, you're asking them to get on a demo. Step four, that's the last one, get the, actually have the demo. But you ask them to schedule it, and if they don't, you have to follow up. So let's take a look at an email sequence that I put together specifically for this. And this was back last uh, summer when I was doing early access for Bluetick. And you'll see that there's blah, 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 purpose, questions from user. Those are things that I filled in as kind of a template. Um, and then you'll see a link to my calendar link. Next thing is that the second email was sent on uh, two days later after that first one if they did not uh, actually schedule a time for the demo. And you'll see here that this is an odd time. Three days later, at 7.12 a.m. And the nice thing is that when I do demos for this, I tell them brutally honestly, like I do not get up at 7.12 a.m. for anybody, let alone sending you an email. But I show that to them specifically because it lets them know how their customers are gonna be treated. And it is highly effective, not just because it is consistently being sent three days later, but also because of the timing and the, the control that you have over that. Next, you'll see five days later, four days after that, um, emails are automatically being sent. That consistency is key to making this entire thing work, to making it get to that nearly 80% response rate. So let's take a look at a, a real life example of what this looks like on the other end once you kind of get through uh, the kind of the, the setup of the, the design of that. So here you'll see, um, I don't know how well you can read some of this text just because it's a little small, but it says high contact that first name and then it's got a default for it. Um, but it basically just invites them to the demo and it has all the, the text in there that I had before. And this is what it looks like on the other end. And I blurred out the, the name of this person, but you see here that this email is heavily based on the previous template that you saw in the, other, in the uh, previous screenshot. So you'll see that at the very end, would you like to get on a short call? But that first step is highly personalized based on a form that this person had filled out. And I looked at it and said, oh, okay, well, what can I say to this person to try and get them to that demo? So I customized it, made it look like I'm specifically sending this email to her and trying to get her to a, a demo. A couple days later, next one goes out. Um, this says 7.12, or it says 12.12 12 p.m. because uh, of the time that I took the screenshots, I was in Germany at the time, and uh, so it's five hours in the other direction, so otherwise it would say 7.12 a.m. But the point is that it's consistent. That consistency about having it automatically be sent out without me having to go into my Gmail or without me having to get a task reminder that says, hey, now you've got this thing to do, you've gotta go through and send us email out to this person who didn't remind you, and by the way, you suck because did, they didn't reply to you yet. So it, it avoids those negative feelings, those negative associations, and why should you have to worry about it? If, that, if you can automate that stuff and get it out of your life, that's a, a much better way to approach it. And then at the bottom here, what you'll see is that it's replying to a previous email. I would highly, highly recommend that if you're sending out emails to people and you're doing follow-ups, go back in your mailbox and reply to the previous email that was sent. And if you do that, there's a couple of things that happen. One is it proves to the other person that you actually did send a previous email. It shows that you, you took the effort to say, huh, this person's probably kind of important to me and let me go through and I wanna make sure that I follow up with this person to uh, verify that are, are you interested, are you not? Um, just closing that feedback loop with them and making them feel like they're, they're special to you. Again, 
several extra steps after this. I won't um, dig into the rest of it, but you can see that there's other uh, uh, timings and stuff associated with it. Most of these are all templated. I don't touch them after that very first step. It's just, it sends these out and tr basically tries to get them to click on that first link in the first email. And once you've done all this, once you put it all together, that's when you've unlocked that achievement. You've figured out whether or not they've received it. Um, if, you do, if you are getting those responses, uh, you know that they've understood it, you know that they've made a decision, and you're getting the feedback that you need. Now, if they don't respond in any way, shape, or form, at some point you have to make the decision. Do I continue to try and follow up with this person? And it depends on a lot on how warm your leads are, it depends on where they are in your sales funnel, why they're in that situation. If it's an invoice, you probably wanna follow up with them until the end of time. If it's a cold email, probably not so much. After four or five emails, you probably just wanna say, hey, look, it's not a great time, why don't we move on? And what this does is it allows you to avoid that email black hole where your emails are having a fantastic time. So, with all of that said, um, I do want to leave you with uh, one last thing. I have an email course that is on the Blue Tick website. You can go there. Uh, the link right next to try it, there's a free course link. It says learn how to do automate your follow-ups. It's a free six-part email course. Talks a lot about what uh, I just talked about in this particular talk and helps to kind of educate you on different ways that you can automate it. Um, you don't need to use Blue Tick. You can, but you don't have to. There's a lot of different ways to automate your email follow-ups. Um, uh, several other speakers have talked today, the, the attendee talks earlier, uh, I think it was Chris and Matt both talked about uh, email follow-up strategies, and this incorporates a lot of that stuff in there. And MicroConf would not be complete without its traditions. So, of course, you know, uh, we, we typically have slides where we share pictures of our families. So, I wanted to show one from 2016. And I do want to point out this little piece right here. Because if you zoom in, he looks like he's having a fantastic time. <laughs> and I will say that over the years, over the past couple of years of running BlueTick, I will say that running a cold email system or a warm email system and doing these, these follow-ups, if you're trying to do this stuff manually, it becomes a roller coaster. And it is emotional highs and lows, and it sucks. <laughs> and some people don't learn that maybe there's a different way. And I hope that that's not you. So thank you very much. If you have questions for me, I'll take them now. But you can also find me uh, on Twitter, at SingleFounder. Uh, or you can just read out, reach out to me directly through email, mike at bluetick.io. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Mike. Who has a question about email follow-ups? All right, over here. I'm going to run. Uh, anyone else have a question? Put up your hand right now so Rob can see you. Nice and high. Excellent points. Uh, thank you. Is it a good idea to send out a separation email uh, if you don't hear back? Uh, and should you send that out to warm leads uh, or just cold leads? So by separation email, you mean kind of like a breakup so email, right? The last email, yeah. yeah. Um, so it depends a lot on how you phrase that particular email. So. The typical breakup email, if for anyone who's not familiar with it, is you've sent them three, four, five emails, and then you say, hey, I haven't heard back from you. If I don't hear back from you, I'm going to assume you're not interested, and I'll never talk to you again. So you're essentially trying to break up with them and convince them to take an action. And what I don't like about that is it puts you in an awkward position where if you want to follow up with them in the future, it puts you in a really poor position because now you're a liar if you actually come back to them. And the other thing is that if they were trying to actively ignore your emails, they're probably like, oh, thank God, that person is gone. They're never going to email me again. But if you, three months later, email them, now you're a liar. However, if you change that around and say, hey, this is probably, maybe this isn't a good time for you. Uh, let, me, uh, let me follow up with you in two months or in three months or in six weeks, something along those lines. And if you've automated that process to follow up with them actually in six weeks because they haven't responded, now when you do follow up with them in six weeks, they're gonna say, damn it, now I have to actually respond to this because I didn't wanna to talk to them. And now you get that loop closed for you. The other thing is that it shows that person that you're committed and you are going to do what you've said that you will do. So they're more likely to trust you assuming that they actually uh, have the problem that you're trying to solve. So I have very mixed feelings on the breakup email. I do know that it does work. I've used it myself in the past, but 
it closes doors that you might not want to actually close. So I'd be very judicious about when you use it. Next question. Uh, over here. Um, one, one thing I worry about uh, specifically with automated follow-ups is like it'll follow up when they've already contacted me like a different way or something. Uh, have you ever seen that happen? Should I just not worry about that? Um, how often do things go awry with automated things? I will say that they can go awry a lot. It depends on the tools that you're using. That's also partly why I built Bluetick in the way that I did. Um, so I looked into other tools that were built in various ways, like Gmail API is notorious for missing things. Um, there, there's also like, auto, like at least like a 60 minute delay in certain cases for certain types of things. But a lot of it boils down to what your call to actions are in the emails. And if you are sending those emails out in such a way that the call to action is a, like a phone call, for example, you probably want the ability to control when those emails go out to be a manual push. So you essentially have to approve them at that point. That's also built into blue ticks so that you don't have to worry about it. Um, if it's based on filling out a form or a survey or scheduling a call, um, Bluetech has Zapier integration as well. So if they actually schedule a call, it can close that loop and it can pull them out of the email sequence. There's other tools that can do similar things, but you really do have to be careful about that because once you've destroyed the illusion that you are personally sending those emails, then you're much, your, your response rates are going to go down because at that point they are seeing that, oh, you're using this automated tool to send those emails and they're less likely to take them as seriously when they get the second, third, or fourth email follow-up. They're like, oh, well, that's just a, an automated system. It's not really Mike sending emails. And I've been accused of sending emails through Bluetick when I haven't actually been doing it. I sent you know, individual real replies. They're like, oh, this was sent through Bluetick, wasn't it? I was like, no, I actually did send this. So. Next question. Uh, I've got one more here. I think we got time for uh, maybe two more. Okay, there's one over there. So Phil's got a question here, and then okay. that person over there. Hey, Mike. Um, I don't know the laws around uh, emails all that well, but um, I see a lot of in uh, emails that I get uh, unsubscribed links, mm -hmm. and I think those are maybe necessary to uh, conform to can spam or something like that. So does this kind of tow does something like Bluetick or any other kind of automated but uh, very personalized automation, does it toe the line between what's automated and what's, I don't know the other term, transactional? Do you have to include unsubscribe links? And is that a tell? Um, it is a tell. Uh, and it is towing the line either way. Because even if you have an unsubscribe link in there, it does not necessarily mean that it's compliant to any given regulations. Um, but it is a tell, and that's why Bluetick by default doesn't include them, so it doesn't look like it was sent by that. It's also why I position it for warm email follow-ups and not cold email follow-ups, because with cold email follow-ups, you're more likely to encounter the type of customer that wants to blast out large numbers of emails to people that they have zero relationship with. Um, so I tend to try and avoid that, but it's not to say that I don't have customers who aren't using it for that. Um, in terms of the laws themselves, there's three different classifications of emails. There's transactional, which is you just bought something from me and I send you a receipt. So that's transactional. Um, then there's commercial, which is where I'm pitching you something. I'm trying to get you to buy something. And so that's the second category. And that's really where the can spam laws come into, come into play. And then the third one, oddly enough, the government has named it other. So that's pretty much everything else. And that's really kind of the area that not just blue tick, but pretty much every e automated email follow-up software um, falls into. The reason that you find companies like MailChimp or Aweber or Drip or any of those mass email marketing automations, the reason that they include unsubscribe links is because they're trying to protect the sender reputation of their IP addresses. It has nothing to do with spam laws. It has to do with the fact that if they get enough outbound emails coming from one of their servers, that get marked as spam, then they could end up on a blacklist and your $50 a month or $100 a month means almost nothing because they've got you know, $50, $100,000 a month worth of customers that are also using that server to send out emails. And they're trying to protect their own revenue stream, which I'm not saying I disagree with. I think that's a very smart move, but that's why they do it. It has nothing to do with spam loss. Hi, Mike. I have a question about follow-up outside of email. Mm -hmm. What is your take on following up by phone, text, or social as one of the touch points? Um, I think that's a fantastic idea. That's the direction that Bluetick is going to. That um, There's a special name for it. Rob, you probably remember this off the top of your head. It's uh, multi-something marketing. Multi-channel, I, I think. Multi yeah. yeah. Um, that's a direction that Bluetick's headed. It's not there yet, but um, that's on the radar. 
Um, but I, I do think that there's a lot of value in following up through different channels. I have seen cases where uh, I've sent people invoices before and they've ended up in spam, which, you know, I guess I'd put it there too, but <laughs> <laughs> it shouldn't be there. But um, I, I have had emails, uh, I've had emails where I've, I've hired somebody and then three or four days later we start working on a project. Um, actually, Adam Clark is here. He did the Blue Tick, the website design for Blue Tick. And we started the project, and about a week later, he emailed me and said, hey, I emailed you this, and I haven't heard back from you. And I was like, wait, I, and I went in my email, and the email from him to me had ended up in spam. And this is a week after I'd hired him. So, you know, there's that disconnect there. Like, you don't know unless you send the follow-up email. So clearly, he found me, sent me the follow-up email, but he didn't use Blue Tick, so. All right, uh, it, we have more questions. There's like two more, but I think let's end it here. And if you want to get Mike after, you can do that. I, I'm just a scheduled Nazi. I'm sorry. Everyone, can we thank Mike for uh, his talk?